Ralph Fasanella is an American artist. Because he has never had any formal training, he paints in what art historians call a naive or primitive style. Fasanella has been painting for almost half a century, but for the first 25 years he labored in obscurity. Few sales, no recognition. Then in 1972, New York Magazine ran a cover story on Fasanella, calling him the best primitive painter since Grandma Moses. Suddenly, Fasanella was famous, and his paintings began to sell. Nineteen years later, in May of 1991, hundreds of friends and admirers joined Fasanella for a short trip from Wall Street at the bottom of New York City, past the Statue of Liberty, to Ellis Island in the middle of New York Harbor. Here in the Great Hall where millions of immigrants, including Fasanella's own parents, first saw America, Ralph Fasanella would have one of his paintings permanently installed. It would be the culmination of a lifetime of painting. For almost 50 years, Ralph Fasanella has been painting ordinary people at work and in their communities. This painting of a New York City street festival reflects the influence of the Italian-American immigrant community in Greenwich Village, where Fasanella grew up. Kids play baseball in the street, between the tenements and many of Fasanella's paintings of the old neighborhood. All I did as a kid, my dream was I wanted to be a ball player. I was making images, walking, catching the ball, hitting the ball, you know. That was all I would think about. Baseball is a, is a ballet. Baseball, to the guy in the street, to the guy, he, he wouldn't say he loves the ballet. He wouldn't say he loves the dance. But he sees it and he loves it. I, there's a cutout in today's Daily News, two people. Flying in the air, that's the modern dance. All the things that you see in baseball, guy jump, guy sliding, he runs, he's catching, going up like that. If you told a guy that, you know, you see a ballet guy, don't they? If you told a guy, he's a this bad, and the guy's catching the ball. But probably if you don't catch it right, they boo you. So you gotta be very graceful. And if you're not graceful, everybody, he's not a ball player. In this street ball game, a church at the end of the block is the center field wall. Meanwhile, up on the roof, a single figure gazes toward the suburbs in the distance. The painting is titled, Pie in the Sky. Fasanella's family never made it to the suburbs. In fact, as a kid, he got into trouble and spent some time in reform school. What happened was, I don't know, I didn't go to school and we used to play hooky. And I just played and one day I found myself went to reform school. I really didn't know what ever happened. You know, here's a kid, you're tied to your mother and father and family, and now you're brought into this strange place. Bricks, red bricks, and monks, and the monks looked dead. They weren't human. The hard beaten people. And plus, every time you made a mistake, you got hit with a stick. That guy's got a bamboo stick. I can't see it here, but he's got a bamboo stick, piece of rope. You had a bamboo, you had to put your hands out. Fasanella's paintings feature ordinary people in everyday situations, like the butcher at the corner meat market. New York City subway riders. This is his brother's filling station in the Bronx, where Fasanella was pumping gas when New York Magazine discovered him. And this is the shop where he was a labor organizer, encouraging workers to join the union. 
It was 1944. Fasanella had not yet started painting. When I was organizing in Western Electric, I believe, in 1944, I was getting itchy fingers and my finger had cramps. They were painful. Well, they ached. Something was wrong with them. I met a very bright guy, an exceptional bright guy that worked at the shop. I said, you know, I forget his name now, Franklin, in fact. Uh, yeah, anyway. I said, what? he said, what's the matter, Ralph? I said, my goddamn fingers ache. Is something's happening to my fingers. I think I got off right. Yeah, I started what you do. He said, it was an art school up on 23rd Street, whatever it is, go over there and check in, start to do. So I went to the slaver school and had an art department. I got in there and I saw myself looking around and I felt kind of funny because uh, some people saw me and said, what the hell's Ralph doing in art school? You know, he's not an artist, he's a worker. So the guy said, well, what the hell are you doing in the art class? You're an organizer. At that time, I could... I could These do days, Fasanella spends a lot of time in schools, sharing his work and his life story with young people. So, uh, you know, so I, had to, so I was ashamed. But then later on, it had to come out. And someone gave me a pencil, I went out, I bought the posters, the little dime bottles, 10 cents, you got the poster colors? Huh? Mm -hmm. I bought them there, and I did it on paper. And the, the whole world exploded to me. Man, I couldn't sleep. I really found love. And it was like a dream. I'd get up at 7 in the morning, 11 at night. I ran to the Whitney Museum, Museum of Modern Art. i never been to me. All of a sudden, I was going to museums every day. And painting, I couldn't sleep. Painting, painting, painting. I got all kinds of cameras. Never took a lesson. But already, I formulated these ideas and concepts in my mind. And I found, once you become a painter, the world up, 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 you open up. There's so many different things being a painter. But was there any one painter that inspired you? A painter inspired me? Mm -hmm. The first time I saw Van Gogh, I said, what the hell is this man doing? I know Van Gogh. I, I went to the museum on art, they charged 35 cents. I saw Van Gogh, uh, I said, what's this man? Then I find out, now he's, he's my hero. But the other thing that I've been fortunate enough, i put a lot of years in the labor movement. I'm in what we call the struggle of the working man. That gave me a base of operation. I got involved with a lot, a lot, a lot of labor history. And I got involved with people, and I got involved with the political times that we live in. And so I've had something to hang on. I have a philosophy. It was the Union of Force for Free Education. All the things, all the benefits that we have today, the pension plan, the eight hour day, five days a week, hospitalization, all came through unions. Yeah, I got involved in unions in the 1930s. I was in the shop to organize hospital workers, electrical workers. Common works. I organized that volunteer. I don't even want to. I was a volunteer organizer for Local 65, which part of UAW today. I organized hospital workers. I organized the. Uh, uh, I worked for the Teamsters, you know? I worked for a lot of unions. And the union all becomes a place where you converge and you sit and you talk. You go to form a union, you're going to be recognized. There was never any recognition when you married a working guy. All of a sudden, a guy gets up and says, I want to join a union. Oh, yeah, come on. And all of a sudden, they saw democracy in action by people who didn't have all the answers, but had part of the answers. And the important thing about the union meetings in those days, little of the worker came, but the women, for the first time, were breeding there. They were able to come to a place and express their, but they never did. And all of a sudden, the woman came in, they, they took the lead, they took a tremendous lead. And all the big strikes, the women played a big part. In 1912, the state of Massachusetts passed a law reducing the work week from 56 to 54 hours. When the textile mill owners in Lawrence responded by reducing their employees' pay, 23,000 workers walked out on strike. It seemed unlikely they could sustain a strike against the powerful mill owners, especially during winter. But they stuck together, and after months of hardship, they finally won. Fasanella has painted a series of large canvases depicting this great strike. And this is the whole panorama view of that strike. I put it together. And I watched all the newspapers, all the newspapers, you know? And I did all the newspapers. What happened at that time in 1912, they put a law in, reducing the hours. But the wage cut, it amounted up about a, a loaf of bread a week, and they couldn't take it. And, and uh, at, you know, at that time, guys make ten, fourteen dollars a week. And they said, well, the only way we can get this is we're going to have a strike. And they, they, they called the strike, and they won it. I think I mentioned, you know, they won the strike, and this is the first strike we won in America, 1912 strike. 
Now, but I think it's a lot to do to the women. They get all the women together, and they, they're a spearhead of the strike. And they had the mil- you know, men, after a while, get tired out of it. The hell with it. But the woman, you know, these women got up, and they went near the houses of the strikers. Hey, you, shape up. You got to go to pick a line. It was a woman that carried a strike in Lawrence in 1912. Also, they were able to unite all different people. Italians, Armenians, Russian, Poles, Jews, Irish. They all these people together, and they beat the company. The first major strike we won. Soon after America entered World War II in 1941, labor unions supported the war effort by pledging not to strike. The CIO has made a commitment to the President of the United States of America that during the course of the war, there will not be a strike of any kind. So when they had won the war and the servicemen were being welcomed home, workers and returning soldiers alike expected a raise in wages. When the big companies refused their demands for an additional 17 and a half cents an hour, strikes broke out across the country. The costliest maritime strike in America's history silences ports in a tie-up more effective than any wartime blockade of shipping. New York Harbor, like San Francisco, New Orleans, Boston, and Seattle, is thoroughly crippled. Some 1,600 U.S. vessels are immobilized. What happened after World War II, a lot of people begin to be laid off, especially the women. A lot of shops are closing. And it, 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 it got the, 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 uh, the union leaders frightened. What the hell's going on? And then the unions were going to get even because during the war time, they gave up overtime, they gave up a lot of things. Now came World War II, it's the end. They want to cash in. And the company said, how would you? Especially the big outfits. The auto, automobile industry, the steel industry, electrical industry, and all, all the other big industries didn't want to give the people anything. Fasanella is the son of Italian immigrants. His father spent most of his life delivering ice out of a horse-drawn wagon. His mother worked as a buttonhole maker in a dress factory and raised the children. And remember one thing, we're always immigrants. And we all keep our own identity. It is important we are what we are. I'm an American, but I feel Italian. What can I tell you? That's the way I feel. I talk that way, I feel that way. I think when you be to yourself and be true to yourself, it's painful, but you get more out of life. What do I paint? I paint my family. I work. My unions, the kids going to school. I paint my surroundings. And you root what you're I'll reading, what you're coming from. It's like coming from your mother, your father. And you read this thing, it's part of your life, it's hanging on the corner. And what did you do as a kid? Where were you from? Remember who you are. Remember your roots. Remember where you came from. Then you find people that lose their roots crack up mentally. And the more roots you have and the more you're around, you paint the baseball parks or the corner. And you begin to have these people as an identity and they feel you emotionally. You need this thing for the soul. All I'm saying, don't forget your past. From an early age, Fasanella worked with his father on the ice truck. This is my father had an ice truck. And while the kids were playing, I was working. So I was always watching. I observed, I observed, I observed. Here I am right there, looking. Okay? And this is my father. And you'll notice throughout my paintings, <coughs> uh, the ice wagon. But at that time, you know, I'm six, seven, or eight, or nine. And I'd come out there, and I'd get on a wig, and I'd start to sleep out of seat. Then he'd say, what the hell are you sleeping about? Hey, man, he said, you can't sleep at this hour. Remember the European guy, he used to send his whipping pug because, listen, in my life I broke my ass, in this life you're going to break your ass. This is not a sweet life. You might as well know it now. Huh? Go ahead. Sorry. In the one yeah, with your, go ahead. your father, and he's the martyr, and he has an anchor also. Like That's the ice tongues. Him. Oh, those are oh, ice tongues oh, in his oh, brains. Okay. Oh, in yeah, you know the Italians, my mother, when she was angry at my father, she would say, I can't use the word, you're all too young. <laughs> my mother would, would, would blast, and she would talk to me about my <laughs> father, that son of a, <laughs> the tongues ought to go through his brains, you know. And all of a sudden, as a kid, you make images. That's how you get images. That's how I got them from, you know. That I 
uh, put my father on the cross and some of the other guys. I think in a way, working man, if you look at his face, he's a beaten down. He's beaten down. It could be an Italian, Jew, or Greek. He looks like Christ, suffering man. But when you look at your pictures, all working class, and you're representing them, is it also that um, you're paying respect to them? I sure am. The working class. I have enough stuff coming out of Delhi Press from how miserable the people are, how crooked they are. I'm going to tell you, they can't be too bad. They go to work every day. They produce, they change the world upside down. How bad can they be? With all the weaknesses, take a look at the working class, right? They're positive. They're the, the most productive class, the most dynamic. They make the things. They, you know, they produce the steel. They're carpenters, plumbers, bricklayers, cloning workers. They're uh, coal men, they, they, the mines, you know. They're the farmers. What the hell more do you want? You know what I've been talking about? Huh? They're the backbone of our society. Oh, sure. Without them, we'd fall apart. <laughs> On the day he was to be honored at Ellis Island, Bassanella visited a garment shop much like the one where his mother had worked 60 years before. It is still filled with immigrants, but today they are Chinese rather than Polish, Italian, or Jewish. That same day, he returned to Greenwich Village, visiting the apartment where he grew up. And that was the inspiration for Family Supper, the painting that was to be installed at Ellis Island. Both of these visits and the memories they evoke were very much on Fasanella's mind as the boat crossed New York Harbor and approached Ellis Island. this painting. It will now belong to the United States government forever. It will be forever taken care of. This painting is now a part of Ellis Island. Here I am at the age of 76. And what happened to me today? I went down to Sullivan Street. I became the immigrant again. Went to this building. My friend Ron Carver walked up third floor. He said, Ralph, come up here. I, I think my family came here after World War I. Went to the apartment the third floor, and there was this beautiful woman. And to be honest with you, you could be my mother who I look at, you know, and this is what it's it all about. My mother and your mother. I am Maltese. I'm from Malta. And uh, my husband is Puerto Rico. And she came from Malta. Two kids, round table, clean house, everything in order. What was the fault? Our husband, Puerto Rican, the janitor of the, of the building. And we take care of it, of the building. We keep it clean. That building sparkled like this building sparkled. That, that apartment was so clean. I said, geez, you're just like my mother. But today I had a different type of experience. I went up to a ladies' garment sh shop. And who were there? Chinese people. Jesus Christ Almighty, here I am. Dying. Ah, oh, look, look. They're not Jews. They're not Italian. <laughs> what a Chinese people. Working at the machine. Working at the machine. Working at the machine. I looked at these and I started drawing them. You know, and I got thinking, and I have a dress shop. 
This, this is dress shop in the 1930s, 1940s. I said, ma'am, I'm going to come up in a few weeks. You know something? When I get through, all these people I know. This is my sister. My sister will be there. My mother will be there. You'll be there. And all these people that I'm paying an Asian, they're us. And we're them. And that's what this thing is all about. We can't separate ourselves from the Hispanics, the African people, the, and the Asian people, you know? When you paint, do you paint for yourself or do you have a specific like, audience mind? Who is it that you paint for? When I got to paint for an audience like you, otherwise I fail. I have my audience, that's my people. I'm a working guy, I'm a guy from the corner, full of factory work, I'm a carpenter, bricklayer. I'm everything that most people are. Now I don't paint for Wall Street or the people upstairs, you know, the rich people. I'm not saying, I don't know them, I only know you, so who am I gonna paint for? And if you wanna be a good painter, right? You wanna be a good person, you wanna be something good, you gotta take things in a social context. Go to Harlem, 25% of you young black people are working, hang out on corners. Go to lower, at least 12, 15% the white kids are not working. Go to Benson, they're not working. This is the crime of our society. The crime of our society, no people have homes, medical care, old age pension, no jobs. That's the crime of our society. And as I said before, the most important thing, what's lacking, I find, in the art, they don't paint their identity. You got your own neighborhood, your own family, your own friends. And then you can go any part of the country and paint. Then you can go any part of the world to go. So you have to pick your thing, the thing that fits you, and that's what you have to do in paint and everything else. And remember one thing, we're always immigrants. And we all keep our own identity. It's important we are what we are. Remember who you are. Remember your roots. Remember where you came from. All I'm saying, don't forget your past.